In this episode, we're going to be painting a Forge World Resin Imperial Aquila Lander here at Bunker 6. It might get a little bit Bob Ross in places, just warning you. Because this model is from the first iteration of Aeronautica Imperialis, and I have no intention of playing this in the second iteration of Aeronautica Imperialis because I don't think there are any rules for it, I decided to put on a larger base and have some fun with it in this episode. I have tried to always do something new in each episode which challenges myself, and in this case we're going to try something completely different by painting some clouds. Once I've got the base ready, I then move on to prepping the base further for paint. What I'm going to do is get rid of the textured surface of the base, slowly sand it down to a smooth finish, not entirely smooth, because I don't mind there being a little bit of texture there because we're doing the sky, and of course we're working on clouds, so I'm not too fussed about having a little bit of rippling here and there. Just getting some of the very top of the texture off and getting it smooth, and then we'll let the paint do the rest of the smoothing out. Following the smoothing of the base, I then moved on to priming the base, just so we've got the paint job being nicely locked onto this smoother surface. Once the primer had dried, I then moved on to doing a white base coat. You can use any white you like though. I just decided to use this bold titanium white because I quite like how it finishes when it's dry. I did multiple layers of this white, just to really smooth out the base a little further. I then proceeded to paint the darkest blue in one corner, and slowly gradiate up towards the white, leaving a little bit of the white at the top, because I didn't want the entire thing to be covered in dark blue. I then added my lighter blue to the opposing corner to the dark blue, just to create a nice transition between the two. The blue was left to dry, and then I found a pretty janky old brush that I had, as you can see. There isn't a point on this brush, there's about 36 points on this brush, which is actually quite useful for the task at hand. I'm trying to create randomness, a little bit like you do when you're trying to create weathering spots with a sponge, but in this instance we're using a brush. Now I'm just lightly dabbing, I'm not going in too hard too soon, because I want to create a buildup of effect rather than going whole hog straight in with a big splotch of paint and then not being able to do much with that. The trick here is layering. Now, even if you do make a mistake like I did here, we'll be able to fix that by adding additional highlights and shading to it later on. But don't try and add more paint to it because you'll only increase the problem. Now we're moving on to some minor smudging. I don't know why I thought this was a good idea, but it seemed to just create a bit of misting effect here and there. I just put down a little bit of wet paint and then spread it out with a larger brush. Generally a stiff brush is going to be the way to go with this. It's kind of like dry brushing, but instead you're just scraping the paint across the surface. One thing to bear in mind is using a reference picture is a very good idea. Even if you don't follow it exactly, it just gives you a little bit of confidence knowing that there's something that you can copy or follow just to make sure the formations still feel natural. Once I'd built a basic formwork of what I was looking for with my pattern of clouds, making sure that I had larger clouds towards the front in the darker blue area, and less and more sparse clouds further away in the distance, I got the idea of a foreground and background with the clouds which gave me the density that I was looking for, and then I was able to move on to doing some shading and some highlights. I made sure that the shading stayed at the bottom of the clouds, and all the brilliant white highlights were on the edges of the top of the clouds, as you'd expect. Now I'm using a fine detail brush to do the highlights and the shadow work because I wanted a little bit more accuracy. But all I'm doing is filling in the forms that I created with that roughed up brush, making sure that I make the highlights stay at the top and the shading stay at the bottom of each cloud making sure there's some uniformity in those highlights and shading, just to give it a natural feel. You don't need to be hyper accurate with this stuff because they are clouds after all. You can try other formations, 
but I seemed to fall into the similar pattern each time when I was doing the work that I was doing here. The only exception to this is the large cloud in the bottom left that you can see here, but I am just adding some dark blue back in over the top of it again because it was a little bit too intense considering its size. I did a few additional cleanup tweaks off camera, but now the cloudy base is complete. Now, quite some time ago, the very early stages of my YouTube career, I had said that I wanted to make sure that my Imperial Guard army was a desert-themed army. Now, the problem with that is I've changed my mind. I think that the great thing about the Imperial Guard is there's so many different things that you can do with Imperial Guard, from Katachan jungle fighters to the troops from Valhalla. I don't want to miss out on being able to paint those different types of armies on my YouTube channel. Now I could just duplicate models and do them just for the video, but I would rather just actually have an entire army of varied Imperial Guard models. So that's what we're going to be doing. And this is the first model that's getting a redo from my desert theme idea and is going to be getting painted instead in a more official color scheme that I found online. Now, of course, with Imperial Guard or Astra Militarum, you can paint things however you want, but I do like following law-friendly paint schemes when I can. And I found the Aquila Lander was generally painted in this red and black theme, so I followed suit. I like to get my reds a double-decker bus red. If you're from England or from Europe, you'll probably know what I'm talking about, but a very punchy, bright red. So I generally like to do a corn red to Mephiston red, then do this magic trick of adding a Vallejo transparent red layer that just makes the red completely pop. If you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. It turns a quite dull paint job of red into a very super saturated and vibrant red. It's not always useful with every application of red, but for things like this, it's going to do the job perfectly. Once I was happy with how punchy the red was, I moved into blocking out certain sections with black paint. You can use any black paint you want. It doesn't matter if it has a particularly shiny finish or a matte finish, that's all down to personal preference. And with most of these types of paints, you definitely want to do thin coats, two, even maybe three coats sometimes. It all just depends on the pigment of the paint that you're using. Do take your time, and if you are seeing streaks of previous layers of paint still cutting through, don't get impatient. Just take your time and add those layers slowly and let each layer dry so you don't get any acrylic paint tearing, which is a complete nightmare to deal with. Blocking out paint like I'm doing here is also very useful in terms of concentrating your eye on the areas that need attention. So once everything was red was red, I knew that nothing else on that model needed to be red. And I know that because I blocked everything else out with black paint that didn't need to also be red. It's kind of an organization thing visually for me. I think a few other painters do that too. The other great thing about blocking out with black paint is it's very useful for metallic silvers. I really like throwing metallic silver over a black layer rather than anything else. It just makes it a much more brutish and punchy finish. And I'm sure I say this every time, but make sure that you don't use the same wash pot for your metallic paints as you use for all your other paints. Otherwise, you're going to contaminate your non-metallic paints and that's going to really bug you. Now we're moving on to the windshield. And as you can see, I'm just putting down a layer that's cutting away from the red. This layer doesn't particularly matter what it is. I'd rather go lighter than darker here, but it's a mid-tone really is what I'm trying to go for. It's quite a light mid-tone. But after all the additional work that we're going to do over this layer, it doesn't matter too much. Now I put a slightly transparent layer just over the top of that base blue layer, just letting the base blue layer still cut through. It's almost like a wash layer, just creating a bit more interest in the blue section before we start hitting it with highlights and shading and reflection too. Once this new blue was dry, I went in with a darker Cantor blue, in this case, to create some dark contrast. Now what I like to do is make sure that I have some idea of where my darks are going and where my lights are going. Treat it a little bit like you would painting a lens on a Space Marine eye socket, because you need to have a place where darkness can reside and lightness can contrast it 
So that's what I've been doing. I've been picking places where I think light should be and darkness should be. And just making sure that those areas become more emphatic with darker and lighter colors to complement that decision. If any professional painters are watching this, they're probably pulling their hair out at my atrocious attempts at glazing. But I like to do things quicker rather than slower. And in this case, at this scale, I'm not too fussed about the glazing being super crisp and super clean. I can always clean that up with additional glazes afterwards, like I end up doing anyway. And if glazing isn't working for you, you can try wet blending. There's plenty of great videos online about wet blending, but I do recommend not trying it at this scale first. It can be quite tricky because you need generally quite a lot of paint on your brush to do it. As with the white, I am now doing with the black in the opposite corner on all of the windshield sections. Constantly keeping in the back of my mind the logic of how you do the lenses on a Space Marine eye. Always making sure that your dark and your lights have realistic oppositions to them, making sure that your glare or your reflection points also make sense. Otherwise the viewer might not necessarily know why it's not sitting right for them. And by the way, there's a lot of different ways of doing windshields. If you look up Warhammer windshield or just Aeronautica Imperialis, there are myriad ways I've seen of painters handling the windshield very differently, but very effectively. So don't just think that this one method is the be all and end all, as I'm sure you probably don't. But this is one way of doing it, but there are some brilliant other ways of doing it too. It just depends on your technical level and how much time you want to put into it. The great thing is, as soon as I've blacked out the framework on this windshield, it's going to look so much tidier and neater and really clean. So I'm not too fussed about how things are looking right now, because I know as soon as I've blacked that frame out, everything's going to pop. One last thing that I want to do to the windshields before I move on is add a filter. A filter is a color that complements everything that you're trying to paint over, but merges and transitions things in a much more neat and natural way. In this case, we're using Gulliman Blue, the glaze version, which is going to do a nice job of creating those transitions and making sure it tricks the eye into things not looking so artificial. Now, as previously mentioned, I am blacking out the frame, and this is where everything really comes together because you're not being distracted by the messy edges anymore. You know, when they say, don't draw outside the lines, well, just make the lines thicker. And that's what we're doing here. Once I finished the framework or that you are seeing right now, I then moved on to the pin wash. Now I was thinking about glossing this and using oil paints, but the model was so small and the lines were so thick, it was very easy for me to just go in with some Agrax Earthshade. I didn't even really need to do much cleanup because the brush that I was using was small enough to handle the job just fine. Once the pin washing was completed, I then decided to move on to the copper sections. Now you don't have to do these in copper, you can just continue to use the silver that we were using previously, but I like the visual interest that it creates. Additionally, they were also copper in the visual references that I was using to paint this model. Now moving on to the longest step of this paint job, the edge highlighting. Now find the thinnest brush you can, generally a one down to triple zero, depending on how thin you want to get your lines and start edge highlighting. Now just bear in mind, if you do make a mistake, you can always go back in with either the transparent red or corn red, then go the transparent red layer over the top of that to fix any mistakes that you make. But just take your time and things should go just fine. Now from the visual references that I found online, the wingtips were quite a dirty brass or copper type color. I had this scale color decayed metal in my arsenal of paints and it seemed to fit the bill quite nicely. I had a feeling that as soon as I layered some Agrax Earthshade over the top of this as a base coat, things were gonna look very similar to the pictures that I found online. And it got pretty close. So that's why I ended up using the colors that I used here. And as mentioned, I then shaded everything on the wingtips with Agrax Earthshade, and I was very happy that my prediction turned out to be pretty accurate. 
especially when the Agrax had dried. Now obviously you don't need to do a one-to-one -one copy of the images you find online, but it is quite a nice test and a nice challenge if you can reverse engineer things without having the recipe in front of you. So that's another reason why I like to take on these kind of jobs, especially when there isn't instructions online for the specific model like this that I'm painting. Now the wingtips was a decayed metal which I used the Agrax Earthshade on, but the propellers were a much brighter brassy colour, so I decided Reichland Flesh Shade would be a much more complementary wash to add over the top, rather than continuing to use Agrax Earthshade for that part. I then moved on to adding Nolm Oil to some of the silver sections, just to create a bit more grit and oiliness around some of the mechanical parts as you'd expect. To create some visual continuity, I used the same brass colour from the propellers as the edge highlighting on the decayed metal. They seem to work quite well together. It does create some homogeneity if you can repeat used colours in different areas on the model like I'm doing here. It doesn't always work, but it does create some natural uniformity if you can do things like that more often than not, I find. Finally, I'm using this same brassy brass colour to create some of the weathering as well. By weathering in this instance, I mean just a few scratches at the front of the plane. Now you can really go a whole hog with the old weathering, from pigments to oil washes to enamel washes, but we're just gonna keep things simple and acrylic only for now, because otherwise this video would be far too long. Now I'm just adding some silver highlights to the areas where I think the plane would require it. Normally that's going to be any areas that are at the top of the said silver sections that would be catching the most light. So the top of the propellers, and top of the engine sections and exhaust sections as you're seeing here, and so on and so forth. Now we're going to be doing the three-stage black highlight process that I do in pretty much all of my black highlight processes, which is go from black to dark reaper, then to some kind of bluey grey, then some kind of white bluey grey, which is much, much brighter, and then finally, some pinpricks of white, if necessary. But right now, we're starting off with a broad highlight, generally edge highlight in this case, where we're going to be going in with the Dark Reaper around all areas of black that require said highlighting. You want to make this quite a broad edge highlight because you still have to go narrower and narrower with the next highlights that come after this. So by making a broad base highlight, it gives you more room for error for the next stages. Just make sure that you take your time with all this kind of edge highlighting because it can get quite frustrating at times, but you just have to be patient and if you make any mistakes, you can easily fix them by adding in the previous layer that you painted over by mistake or whatever happened. Nothing is irreparable apart from say acrylic tears where you create a texture problem but anything where the paint runs in the wrong place or something like that is easily fixable if you just take the time to take a look at it. Things might look a little bit unnatural at first, but you can always go over the entirety of the paint job that you've been working on with the black highlights with a couple of black glazes just to bring down the brightness a little bit and make things feel a little bit more natural and a little less in your face. I decided not to do that because the vibrancy of the red was so hot anyway. I wanted to match that vibrancy with the blacks too. That's why everything almost has a quite cartoony finish to it. I'm not normally a fan of a finish like this, but it's something new for me, and I'm quite happy with how punchy and accurate I got all the edge highlights, so I decided to keep things as they were. For the wing sections here, I decided to pull the brightest points to the middle of the wing rather than to any of the edges. That just seemed like the most sensible thing to do. It might not be the most natural thing to do, but it looked quite visually interesting to me to do that. I then found all the points on the red that needed work, in this instance just the flash highlight. By flash highlight I mean the brightest highlight I intend to layer down for that specific overall colour and then it's going to be complete. Your flash highlight is going to be the smallest highlight that you add to the model generally and it's supposed to be your biggest, brightest and punchiest point, nearly white in most cases. You don't have to go full white but as close as you possibly can to really get the effect that I'm looking for here. Just picking out corners and random areas, you don't want it to feel too uniform, otherwise it can look a little bit boring. But I still like to have things feel slightly natural so they don't come across too contrived. And for me, these final flash effects 
really pull the model together and give the eye some really satisfying things to look at. It almost pops out at you now. The base and the plane are finished. I now just need to add the rim color, which in this case is going to be steel lesion drab. Three to four coats of thinly layered paint, and this model is complete. Thank you so much for watching to the end and hopefully uh, the Bob Ross reference wasn't too on the nose. It wasn't intentional, but I thought, well, you know, planes, clouds, try something new. It turned out okay. I'm pretty happy with the results. Um, I think they could obviously be improved. Obviously, a lot of people use oil paints to do these kind of things and they have phenomenal results. I'm just making excuses for myself at this point, aren't I, clearly? Never mind. Anyway, as always, I'm Vincent and until next time, I'm signing off from here at Bunker 6. Bunker 6.